Hi, welcome to this edition of Risk Engineers Talk Governance. My name's Megan and I'm a producer of the podcast. In this episode, due diligence engineers Richard Robinson and Gay Francis talk about regulations and license to trade. The difference between the two and the confusion and difficulty it's causing for organisations, especially those that work in major hazards. You can listen to the podcast across all major platforms, including Apple, Spotify and Google. And if you enjoy the episode, we'd love you to give us a rating to help us spread the word. Enjoy the episode. If you have any feedback, we'd love to hear from you. Good morning, Richard, and welcome to another podcast. Morning, Gay. We're just rolling on from the previous one. We which, are. Which yeah. we've never done before. That's all right. We thought we'd talk about um, regulations and licence to trade and the difference between the two and some of the confusion and um, the difficulties that it's causing for organisations, especially in the major hazards um, facilities. Um, and 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 the difference between that. Um, so I guess where do we start? Well, I guess I'll explain what the issue is. Um, particularly this flows from the WHS legislation and particularly since the WHS legislation is the enabling legislation for major hazards um, and um, high risk work generally uh, and an awful lot of regulation has been made around this. Now the difficulty you have is that the WHS legislation basically has a hierarchy of two in its hierarchy of controls. You've got to eliminate risks to health and safety and if you can't eliminate them you've got to reduce them all so far as reasonably practicable. But then when you go and look at what the regulators are doing they're all using this risk-based approach and particularly for example if you consider the hierarchy controls of most um, jur jurisdictions most of them have got six. They talk about elimination which is obviously the highest one but then they usually go through substitution, isolation, engineering, administration and PPE. Okay. I think that's one that's yes. about six. Now the difficulty there is that um, the legislation is clear, the hierarchy is two. Eliminate or minimize, reduce yeah. or minimise. When you act as an expert witness, the thing you find out fairly fast, and which we've always done and all the barristers and all the expert witness cases before, all the Supreme Courts which we've done these cases before, it's broken to three. You eliminate, you prevent it from happening, and if it does happen, you then reduce the scale of the outcome. Which is the mitigations. Which is mitigation. Um, so there's crashworthiness in the cars and air, airbags. Whereas for um, elimination is let's have, have cars and road at all and prevention would be uh, Elon Musk's self-drive cars because you don't have to rely on people after so that and it'll just keep, the, keep you away from the accident altogether. I guess, I guess what Richard's trying to say is the engineering aspect of hierarchy controls can work in all of those three. It can eliminate the hazard, can prevent it from happening and it can mitigate the consequences. So it never quite made sense to us that hierarchy control of six or seven um, because engineering could fit into a number of places depending on what you were talking about and what the control was. Well, it always did. That was one thing I've never, I've never, I've never, it's never made sense to me why engineering was deleted from those other ones. I could never figure out why that happened. But from the point of view of the judiciary, it's only in three categories anyway. Now, the only jurisdiction we're aware of that's sort of got three categories is Queensland. Uh, Victoria's got four. Um, Western Australia and New South Wales prefer the six. Uh, as, as the Comcare, um, although I have noticed in New South Wales they've been looking at obviously the Queensland version of three. But even that doesn't quite line up with the... Because they've still got substitution, isolation and engineering in that middle box, that late level two, and then they sort of put their admin and their PPE in the, the lower level of a level three control. But the real point about this, and this is from the point of view of being expert witnesses, um, what this means is that uh, in order to get a licence to trade, you've got to satisfy your regulator. So your regulator says, I want you to do these things, or they ask you to do so prepare safety cases in a certain ways, so you do all these things. Um, but if you're following that hierarchy control, that's very likely to be not consistent with the hierarchy control as articulated by the legislation. And I think a lot of the regulators are actually specifying in some of those safety cases and in those um, requirements of boards that the process is actually in line with ISO 31000, the risk management standard. Correct. And so not only are the hierarchy controls at odds with the legislation, legislation 
and the common law but, as interpreted by expert witnesses. But also the process is in contradiction. So you've got organisations spending a whole lot of extra time doing something to get a licence to trade, which doesn't necessarily meet their legal and their legislative legislative. Yes. Obligations. Uh, obligations. <laughs> Thank you. I was a bit tongue-tied there for a minute. Um, so it's creating a whole lot of extra work for these people for very, very little value. But it's more problematic than that. You see, if, and particularly major hazards who've been using the quantified risk assessment approach, we're, we're about to, we're giving some pro bono advice to uh, somebody in Melbourne for major hazards and, and the fact that the, I think the, the major hazard regulator Victoria suddenly lifted their game and realised that it's all about consequence and the safe harp obligations. Because remember, major hazards is enabled by WHS legislation. And so you get this silly situation that uh, it, it really is bizarre. You're going to have to spend all this money to get a licence to trade and then you have to do it all again in order to make sure you satisfy your legal obligations under the common law and the WHS legislation or in Victoria the OHS Act. And I'm not sure that the board and the senior executive understand that those two pro processes um, contradict each other. But they only understand when... Remember I told you about that... that, well, that we were there for that uh, rail operator who was fretting about um, locos on code red days, diesel locos starting bushfires mm. from the cinders from the stacks. And remember we had the risk lawyer manager. on one side, the risk manager on the other side and us in the middle and we finished our little presentation and the GM looked to his lawyer and said, is what these two just said right? Mm -hmm. And the lawyer said yes. That's the point at which he told us we were under privilege and he turned to the risk manager and said fix it. So from a, a top-down viewpoint and as risk advisors, I guess we always tell our clients to make sure that you satisfy your requirements of your legislation first. And get your lawyer standing with, with you whilst you you're doing to, it. To make sure that they agree with that. And then you do the extra parts, you know, by exception that's required in the licence to trade aspect. Correct. And you so do it in that order. And you do it in that order. And that sort of still brings your workload down. But if you do it the other way around or as two separate processes, um, you're potentially setting yourself up for a fall because you can come up with two very, very different results. Ah, but it's actually worse than that because if you've actually got yourself a risk manager, so-called, who's taken risk, uh, led responsibility. responsibility for this mm. thing and therefore the decision maker, it actually creates a blockage to that understanding to the board. And that's been our experience of briefing the boards. Yes, that they don't have an understanding that there's two different requirements. So you, you might recall we, we were just doing it for the very large international miner, of which there are two on the planet from an Australian perspective, and we weren't allowed to speak to the board or senior management until a lawyer confirmed that what we were saying was the way to do it. Mm. Um, so getting engineers... And we did 13 briefing sessions, I think, didn't we? We did end up doing a lot of briefing sessions for him, so he was obviously happy with what we were saying. And happy for his troops to do it. Um, but coming back to that, you know, I think there is a misunderstanding or a lack of understanding between the two processes and the requirements of that. Um, and engineers and I guess the risk advisors in organisations have that responsibility to bump it up to the people that can make the decisions. Um, we understand that organisations have to work within their regulatory framework, but it can't be contradict requirements of the legislation either. And that happens more often than you might believe. Yeah. So it's so back to the initial the some, some purpose of this. You need to do two things. You need to satisfy your duties, your governance duties under environmental corporations law, WHS legislation, the mind of the corporation via the CEO and, the and board. whatever the, the organisation yeah. is. And in addition to that, you need to satisfy your regulator in order to get a licence to trade. Um, as has been pointed out in the past, you know, being a board member and being in jail is not How? a good result. No. So we hope you found that chat interesting. Uh, we've got a few more chats that we will roll out over the next couple of weeks. Um, and if you've got any comments or questions and um, other ideas, we're happy to... Yeah. One, one, one of the points, we're just having this chat, obviously, and we hadn't particularly planned this because it had been our experience that Gay and I have these conversations in this office about various points, sometimes to Gay's surprise. Some random discussions, yes, do happen in our office, Richard. Yes. But it actually is directed at critical issues that, in governance terms that organisations have to live with. 
and, and you have to deal with both of them. You can't just satisfy you. You, need, you know, you need both, don't you? You need to be able to have your um, your legislative requirements met, but you also have to have your license to trade. Correct. So managing and balancing those two things um, in a, an effective and efficient way is is the, a big and, battle for organisations. And I have to say, it's been our experience too when you're working with clients where they've just been trying to satisfy the regulator, ignoring the legal stuff. It actually doesn't work long term. You just run into a wall. Mm. All right. Thanks for joining us. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.